Magic players refer to creatures with no abilities as vanilla creatures. French vanillas are the name for creatures that only have keyword abilities. French vanillas are usually a bit weaker than creatures with other abilities because those abilities are usually really good. But there are still a lot of French vanillas that have found success in a variety of formats. So today we're going over the best French vanilla creatures in all of Magic. Starting us off at number 10, we have Bane Slayer Angel. This is a 5-5 angel with a mana cost of 3 and 2 white with flying, meaning it can't be blocked by creatures without flying or reach. First strike, which means it deals combat damage before creatures without first strike. Life Link, which means dealing combat damage causes you to gain that much life, and protection from demons and dragons, meaning it can't be blocked, dealt damage by, or targeted by the abilities of demons or dragon cards. We should really quickly mention Lyra Dawnbringer, another angel with the same stats and mana costs and nearly identical abilities, except she trades protection from demons and dragons for the ability to give all other angels plus one plus one in Life Link. Lyra wasn't eligible for this list as the pump ability isn't a keyword ability. Now, back to Bane Slayer. This is a really strong threat that really takes over a game. First Strike makes it very hard to beat in combat, and Life Link on a 5-5 creature is a really hard thing for an aggro deck to race down. Flying is also great for helping Bane Slayer end a game, and protection is just okay. It doesn't come up very much, as your opponent already needs to have a big demon or dragon out. These cards just aren't all that common, so protection is just a small upside that only really comes up in very specific matchups. Usually in standard during Bane Slayer's couple of runs through the format. Bane Slayer was pretty much impossible to beat in combat. If your aggro or mid-range opponent didn't have a removal spell for Bane Slayer right after you played it, it would make it pretty much impossible for them to attack on the next turn, as they'll probably just lose their creature and give you 5 life. It's a great attacker as well, as hitting your opponent once leads to a 10 point life swing, as you gain life and they lose 5 life. Bane Slayer's ability to protect your life total while simultaneously ending the game has made it a strong threat in multiple formats. Bane Slayer was great in Standard, and it's seen sparing play in formats like Pioneer, Modern, and Legacy. Though as time has gone on and those formats have gotten stronger, it sees less and less play in those formats. Nowadays, it's a very rare sight to see it in any of these formats, though you might see it in the sideboard of a white control deck in one of those formats. Bane Slayer Angel is a really powerful card that's just a little bit too expensive to put in much work nowadays, but it still finds its way on this list due to its past success, and the fact that a 5 mana French vanilla seen play at all in these formats is still very impressive. And at number 9, we have Mantis Rider. This is a 3-3 human monk with a mana cost of 1 blue, 1 red, and 1 white, with flying, vigilance, meaning it doesn't have to tap itself to attack, and haste, meaning it can attack the turn it enters the battlefield. Mantis Rider is a great aggressive creature. The combination of flying and haste makes it really good at outputting damage, as it's exceedingly hard to block and can start putting out damage the turn it comes down. Vigilance isn't the best keyword out there, but being able to block and attack on the same turn cycle does help against other aggro decks. All of these attributes are great and let Mantis Rider see tons of play back in its standard format. However, Mantis Rider has also seen a lot of play in Modern, largely due to its creature type. You see, Human is one of the most common creature types in all of Magic, and there are some really great Human tribal payoffs, like Champion of the Parish and Thalion's Lieutenant. Combining this card with cards like Cavern of the Souls and Unclaimed Territory, which lets you tap for one mana of any color, but you can only use that mana to cast creature spells of a certain type, and you have Modern Humans, a five color tribal aggro deck that plays all of the best human creatures that have been printed over the years. Human decks have seen some success in Legacy, but their greatest accomplishment was being one of the best decks in Modern for some time. Human decks having access to so many cards meant they had tons of cards for different matchups. Meddling Mage was good against Storm, Thalia was good against non-creature decks, and Reflector Mage was good against other creature-based decks. Through all of this, Mantis Rider was a consistent inclusion in the deck to give the deck a better clock, which considering the fact that the deck was still an aggro deck was very important. And at number 8 we have Timeless Dragon. This is a 5-5 dragon with a mana cost of 3 and 2 white with flying, plane cycling 2, meaning you can pay 2 and discard this card to find a planes card from your deck, reveal it and put it into your hand, and it has Eternalize for 2 and 2 white, which means you can pay 2 and 2 white to exile it from your graveyard to create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 4-4 black zombie dragon with no mana cost. And while these abilities may seem a little strange, they are all keyword abilities, so it counts for this list. This card is a callback to Eternal Dragon, a 7 mana 5-5 dragon that also has flying and plane cycling, but instead of Eternalize, it has the ability where you can pay 3 and 2 white to return it from your graveyard to your hand, but only during your upkeep. Eternal Dragon was not eligible for this list, but you can see how the cards are fairly similar. They both have plane cycling and a way to generate more value from the graveyard. Timeless Dragon is a really nice consistency booster and value piece. Being able to draw a land in the early game if you don't need your mana, and then come back later as a threat is a really nice bit of value. This card is mostly played as a one-of in fair decks in Modern and Legacy that enjoy the two-for-one inherent in the card's design. 
Now, while the card is pretty good on rate, it's not particularly strong the turn it comes down. It doesn't change the tides of the game when it enters the battlefield, which is why the card has only seen play as a one of. The inevitability it offers by being something to spend your mana on later in the game is really nice, but you don't usually want to draw more than one copy over the course of a game. Still, having one copy is great for any deck that plans to go a little long, which is why the card is usually played in mid-range or control decks like Death and Taxes or Blue-White Control. And at number 7, we have Glistener Elf. This is a 1-1 Elf Warrior with the mana cost of 1 green with Infect, which means that it deals damage to creatures in the form of minus 1 minus 1 counters, and the players in the form of poison counters. And if you didn't know, if a player ever gets 10 poison counters, they lose the game. To understand why Glistener Elf is such a good card, we need to explain why Infect is such a strong keyword. Dealing damage to creatures in the form of minus one minus one counters is nice, as it basically means the damage doesn't go away at the end of the turn like normal, but the main attraction is only having to deal 10 damage to your opponent to win. This means that if you're playing Infect, your opponent basically starts at 10 life. All you have to do is make sure that you're dealing damage with your Infect creatures. Luckily, you can easily speed this up using pump spells. For example, if you play Glistener Elf on turn one, and follow up with Scale Up to turn it into a 6-4, and then use Might of the Old Crosa during your main phase to give it plus four plus four, you can deal 10 damage to your opponent on turn 2. This combo is so strong that Infect decks have been a constant part of both the modern and legacy metagames. Glistener Elf is the only one mana creature with Infect. As a result, it's been a fixture of Infect decks ever since it was printed. There are other really great Infect threats, like Blighted Agent, with Infect that can't be blocked, and Ink Moth Nexus, a land where you can pay 1 mana to turn into a 1 1 with flying an Infect until the end of the turn. However, these cards aren't French vanillas, so they weren't eligible for this list. The one other really great Infect creature that was eligible was Phyrexian Crusader, which is a 2-2 for 3 mana with Infect, First Strike, and Protection from Red and White. Crusader is a great card, but costing 3 mana means that it's usually more of a meta call than a constant fixture in the deck. So, Glistener Elf takes the spot as the Infect representative on this list. And at number 6, we have Strangle Root Geist. This is a 2-1 spirit with a mana cost of 2 green, haste, and undying, which means whenever it dies, if you didn't have any plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, you return it from your graveyard to the battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. A 2-1 with haste for 2 mana isn't good. A 3-2 with haste for 2 mana is pretty good. Getting both for 2 mana is very strong. You do have to wait to get your 3-2, but this puts your opponent in a bad spot. They really don't want to trade anything for your geist that hasn't died yet, which can encourage them to simply not block quite frequently. And since your creature gets better when it dies, you can throw your geist away to punch through damage more often. For example, if your opponent has a 3-3 and you have two guys, you can swing in for some damage and your opponent has to either block and give you a 3-2, or just take all the damage. Now, attacking with both guys won't always be the right answer, but it's definitely a very nice upside. Stranger Root's prowess as a strong beater led not only to it being an all-star for green aggro decks in standard, but it also seen play in a variety of green decks in modern. However, while it is a good aggro creature, some of Stranger Root's best uses have been as combo pieces. One of the better decks in modern right now is Yogmoth combo decks. Yogmoth is a 4 mana creature with quite a few abilities, but the one we care about right now is the ability to pay 1 life and sacrifice a creature to draw 1 card and put a minus 1 minus 1 counter on up to 1 target creature. Now, one of Magic's lesser known rulings is that if a creature has a plus 1 plus 1 counter and a minus 1 minus 1 counter on it, you remove both of them. So, if you have a Yogmoth and 2 Undying creatures, Usually Stranger Root or Young Wolf, you sacrifice one of them to draw a card, bring it back with a counter, then you sack the other one to remove the counter and bring the sacrifice creature back with a counter on it. By alternating which creatures you sacrifice, you can sacrifice as much as you want to keep drawing cards. The strength of this infinite to draw combo has pushed this deck to the top of Modern's metagame, so it easily slides onto this list. And at number 5, we have Bloodbraid Elf. This is a 3-2 Elf Berserker with the mana cost of 2, 1 red, and 1 green. It has haste and cascade, which means when you cast the spell, you exile cards into exile a non-land card that costs less. You can cast this card without paying its cost, and then you put the rest of the exile cards in the bottom of your deck in a random order. We should also really quickly mention Shardless Agent, which is a 2-2 with a mana cost of 3 that also has cascade. Both Agent and Bloodbraid are very powerful cards that have seen a ton of play. But I decided to go with Bloodbraid Elf because I figured it'd be a little bit more recognizable, as Bloodbraid has been legal in both Modern and Legacy for a while, whereas Shardless Agent was only legal in Legacy until it's reprinted Modern Horizons 2. Back to Bloodbraid Elf, a 3-2 with haste for 4 mana isn't a great rate. You would normally want to pay about 2 mana for this effect. That means you're paying about 2 mana for Cascade, and that's a great deal. Even if you hit a spell that costs less than 2 mana, it's still fine because you're essentially paying to draw the spell and cast it at the same time. This means that Bloodbraid Elf is an inherent 2-for-1, and unlike most cards that give you a 2-for-1, 
It's also a great tempo play. You get a hasty threat and something like a removal spell, a discard spell, or maybe another great threat at the same time. This combination of card advantage and tempo made Bloodbrain Elf an absolute staple that was so strong that it was banned from Modern in 2013. Though it was recently unbanned back in 2018, and it's seen a respect amount to play in both Modern and Legacy ever since. And at number 4, we have Sphinx of the Steel Wind. This is a 6-6 Sphinx artifact creature with a mana cost of 5, 1 white, 1 blue, and 1 black. It has Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink, and Protection from Red and Green. Sphinx is a huge threat that's extremely powerful once it sticks onto the battlefield, but it's rather expensive. 8 mana isn't a trivial amount of mana to pay in most formats, unless your deck is specifically built to make this much mana. However, there are ways to get around paying this mana cost altogether. Using a reanimation spell can cheat it out without paying the mana at all. You can also get out with cards like Tinker, which is a sorcery that allows you to sacrifice an artifact to search your library for another artifact and put it onto the battlefield. Both of these cards can let you get a Sphinx out much earlier, which is great because an early Sphinx can end a game really fast. This is the only real way that Sphinx can see play, as paying the mana cost for the card is a little bit too difficult in ramp decks due to the color mana symbols and its cost. In reanimator decks, Sphinx of Steel Wind is a great threat that can end games fast, keeping you healthy with a combination of lifelink and vigilance and is more difficult than normal to remove with its protection ability. It's similarly powerful in Tinker decks and Vintage, though Tinker is such a busted card that the card is only legal in Vintage, and it's restricted to one copy in the format. So Sphinx's success has been somewhat limited. Sphinx has historically seen play in these decks for years, but it has started to dip in use lately. This isn't because the card has gotten any worse, it's just that other, better threats have come out. Grizzlebrand was always the best threat for Reanimator, but Sphinx was still one of a part of the Tinker package back in Vintage for years alongside cards like Blightsteel Colossus and Inkwell Leviathan. However, cards like Balassus Citadel have challenged their spot for the best cards to find off of Tinker. Still, Sphinx of the Steel Wind is still popping up in Legacy Reanimator and Vintage Tinker decks and having competitive success, so it more than earns a spot on this list. And at number 3, we have Street Wraith. This is a 3-4 Wraith with a mana cost of 3 and 2 black with Swamp Block, meaning it can't be blocked as long as defending player controls a swamp, and has cycling pay 2 life, meaning you can pay 2 life and discard this card to draw a card. This card is basically never cast. Being able to draw a card by paying 2 life can be great in a whole bunch of different combo decks. For example, the card sees play in Living End decks, a modern deck that tries to cast Living End off of a Cascade spell and fill the graveyard with cycling creatures, like Street Wraith. Street Wraith is basically a free roll in the deck as it improves your consistency and lets you put out extra damage for no mana, which is amazing. Another deck that makes use of the card is Death's Shadow. Shadow is a 13-13 for 1 black mana that gets a minus X minus X, where X is your life total. The deck needs to play cards to lower its life total quickly, and Street Wraith does a great job at that. Since it doesn't care about maintaining its life total, exactly the opposite in fact, Wraith's cost is actually an upside in the deck. One more example is Doomsday decks in Legacy and Vintage. Doomsday is a sorcery that costs 3 black mana and lets you search your library and graveyard for 5 cards. You exile all of the cards and stack those 5 cards on top of your deck, and then you lose half your life rounded up. If you have a Street Wraith in your hand, you can draw whatever card you want by just paying 2 life. And if you're playing Vintage, where the power 9 are legal, you can make sure you draw Astral Recall, a card that lets you draw 3 cards for 1 blue mana. And since you just got finished stacking your deck, this would make Recall a Demonic Tutor for 3 cards. At that point, comboing off and winning the game is a foregone conclusion. And you'll probably have counter spells to back it up too. Street Wraith's ability to let you draw a card for 0 mana right away is inherently powerful, and more combo decks will use it in the future. And at number 2, we have Gurmag Angler. This is a 5-5 zombie fish with a mana cost of 6 and 1 black with delve, which means that you exile cards from your graveyard to cast the angler, each card you exile paying for 1 mana. Now, this is maybe the least flashy card we've seen so far, but you should never underestimate the power of big, cheap threats. Delve makes any card it's on extremely easy to cast quickly. This is an effect that actually gets better the stronger format you're playing in. Older formats have way more powerful 1-mana cards, and even some 0-mana cards if you're playing a format like Legacy, so graveyards get full very fast. The fetch lands that require you to sacrifice them to use them are some of the best lands in the game, and they also help fill the graveyard quickly. All of this means that having 5 or 6 cards in your graveyard by turn 2 or 3 is very easy. This means that Gurmag Angler is essentially a 1-mana 5-5 that you'll have to wait a turn or 2 to cast. This is an incredible threat, and it's also surprisingly hard for most decks to kill. Some of the best removal spells in formats like Modern Legacy are Lightning Bolt and Fatal Push. They both deal 3 damage to anything, and Push destroys any creature with a mana value of 2 or less, or 4 or less is something you control left the battlefield this turn. 
Neither of these cards can kill Gurmag Angular, as its toughness and mana value are both too high. This makes Gurmag far stickier than it looks at first glance. Gurmag was a multi-format staple for years, though its throne has recently been usurped by a newer card called Murktide Regent. This is a 3-3 with Delve and a mana cost of 5 and 2 blue, and has flying. It has the abilities where it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it for each instant and sorcery you exile to cast it, and when an instant or sorcery leaves your graveyard, you put a plus one plus one counter on it. This card requires you to pay one more mana at least to cast it, but it has evasion and can be far larger than Angler. As a result, Angler is seeing far less play than it used to. Decks can't play too much Delve Threats, so they'll usually just play Regent and leave Angler to the side. Angler isn't seeing play right now, but that's only because there's a better card in the format, so it still deserves a spot on this list. And at number 1, we have Monastery Swift Spear. This is a 1-2 Human Monk with a mana cost of 1 red that has haste and prowess, which means whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until the end of the turn. Swift Spear is just a great aggro threat. There's nothing special here, no tricks or combos that the card pulls off, it's just one of the best red beaters in Magic. Haste is a great keyword and exactly what you want on your red 1-drop. Prowess is similarly great, letting Swift Spear deal far more damage than most similar creatures. One of the best red beaters in Magic is Goblin Guy, a 2-2 with haste and a small downside. If you cast a single non-creature spell on your turn, Swift Spear will be doing the same amount of damage with no downside and more toughness. If you cast at least two non-creature spells, it's dealing even more damage than the guide is. Most aggro decks have more than enough non-creature spells to consistently pump Swift Spear up to around 3 power. The ability to scale up with your casting more spells is so good that some aggro decks have actually warped themselves around the prowess mechanic. Playing a bunch of cheap prowess creatures and cheap spells like Mana Morphous and Lava Dart so they can cast 3 or 4 non-creature spells on a single turn. Unlike most of the other cards we've talked about so far, which are good cards that see some play but are overshadowed by some other cards, Swift Spear is the best at what it does. It's the best threat for burn decks, though it has to share that title with Goblin Guide as they're essentially tied for first. So Swift Spear is easily the best French vanilla creature in Magic. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or do you have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, go ahead and leave a comment down below.